more updates on what's going on in India with the uh, with the farmer strike there. I know I've been covering this quite a bit, but it's important. And, uh, you know, it's it's like me, uh, Left Voice, uh, World Socialist website, uh, Mint Press News. These sort of indie alternative journalists are the only ones that are really covering what's going on with uh, with the strike in India, with the farmer strike in India. So if if you're unaware, I apologize if if you have been following this. I know I know Holly and Sarah and, and a couple other folks that regularly watch this are are like we're up to date because <laughs> you cover it every week. Um, but just in case you're not, you know, I know there's there's people that probably wander onto my channel because of some of the stuff that I cover. Here's what's going on. Um, if you've if you've missed the last couple weeks of uh, of of coverage on on this story. Back in November on Thanksgiving Day, India led the largest uh, general strike, largest strike period in the history of humanity, which was covered by, I believe, one, maybe two corporate media outlets, uh, but various different other uh, truly leftist independent organizations. I mentioned a couple of them, uh, Left Voice, and uh, and of course, a couple comics like myself, Lee Camp, Graham Elwood, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Steph Zamorado, uh, and and of the like. Um None of the big corporate famous outlets really touched it at all. So that happened. Um, and, you know, the unions basically said this was great. This was a good demonstration. I hope that the the leadership knows what we're talking about. And then the unions kind of just let it go. Right. And the farmers continued to strike. And they were um, they were under the uh, behest. No, under the leadership of a particular farmer union. Well, they let a march, right? And this march was supposed to go through Delhi, um, and it was supposed to um, shed light on what's going on. The cops put them on a route that was not great, so they said, "Fuck it, we want to, we want to see what's out there, or we want people to see what's going on here." They broke through the barricades. They broke through, uh, and and they changed their strike route. Cops got pissed, bunch of violence. CNN covers it because now it's violent, right? Because that that's sexy. That's fun. Yeah, America, we love the explosions. Blow more stuff up. Who cares about the strike? Let's see some explosion. Like that's what CNN, you know, CNN basically turned it into um, into explosion porn. Uh, and they and then they basically flipped the narrative. And made the narrative more about how the strike was becoming violent. And this is why you can't support strikes. This is why you can't support the labor movement. Despite the fact that the first people that fired the shots were the fucking cops who are working for the fucking Modi government. And uh, and then after that confrontation happened, there was a, 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 a farmer that died. His tractor overturned. And his family was like, he was shot by the cops. That's why the tractor overturned. And the cops were like, we don't. We don't know. We don't even. What's a gun? Did you guys or you guys all carrying guns? We didn't even know we could do something like that. That's so crazy. Oh, my God. Let's shut down the Internet, which is exactly what they did. They shut down the telecoms and the strike zone so that even the independent journalists that were on the ground interviewing the farmers, interviewing the solidarity strikes. um, they can't get their stories out as quickly as possible. And again, uh, the corporate uh, journalists in in India get to control the narrative. The corporate journalists in the West get to control that narrative as well. Uh, And uh, and then journalists on Twitter got censored, that anybody that mentions to strike, anybody that mentions that this guy, uh, this this Indian farmer, I believe his name was Navmeet Singh, I think. Um they would get censored on Twitter. They would get their accounts taken out or they would get their accounts banned is, is what would really happen there. And all of this was against uh, neoliberal pro big ag farm laws that would essentially fuck over small business farmers and let that privatization of the farming industry in India, which is 58% of the labor force in India to essentially get fucked uh, and, um, and lose their farms. They would lose their farms. They would lose their livelihood because you would have companies like Bayer Monsanto and any other big corporate farms that would come in uh, and and offer better prices to retailers. The gist of what's going on. As of now, uh, they've been on strike for 75 days is what this reporting says. 
Um, and 200 farmers have died. 200 farmers have died due to uh, severe cold weather. Some of these places have very cold weather. Uh, so uh, they, they, they've died of that. Um, and uh, accidents such as, oh, uh, we don't know when you guys have a gun, the tractor just fell over. Maybe he didn't know how to drive a tractor. That sort of bullshit, right? Accidents um, and, or suicide. Uh, farmer suicide rates in India have gone up a lot. Uh, I think, especially since like 2017, uh, thanks to uh, Bear Monsanto. Is that a surprise to fucking anybody? Is anybody shocked that Bear Monsanto coming in with their fucking suicide seeds and their oh my god, how did our plants randomly show up in your farm? I guess we have to purchase it now. And you lose all your livelihood. You know that thing that gives you purpose as a person? We're going to take that away from you. You know the way that you feed your... We're going to take that away from you. And that's what they do. And farmers lose their sense of purpose. They lose their sense of pride. They can't provide for their family. And then they end up committing suicide. Hey, who cares? Bear Monsanto's price line. Go, uh, but their bottom line is, is doing really great, though. Uh, the home minister, Amit Shah of the uh, BJP, which is the more right wing of, uh, the, the two parties in India, the, India has multiple parties, but it's the two, again, it's, it's like America. It's like the Congress party is the Democrats, the BJP is the Republicans. And that's, and then every other voice gets suppressed by the two assholes in power. He has claimed that um, the, the farmer strike leaders are orchestrating mass violence. Yes, the people on tractors with signs and camping equipment are orchestrating mass violence. No, it couldn't be the police that are working on behalf of the Indian government with live bullets, assault rifles, rubber bullets, flashbangs flash grenades chemical weapons such as tear gas that are lobbed into these encampments they're not inciting mass violence no 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 they're managing it how are they managing it by actually committing acts of violence do you see the flaw in the logic there mr shah are you aware do you understand the words that you're saying from your big dumb mouth because I kind of feel like you don't either that or you do and you're just a big dumb asshole either way not great 122 farmers have been arrested for this for striking because they call it anti-government right it's a threat to the Indian government that's how they're pitching this uh, it, because they're all oh, a violence. Oh my God. Basically what they're doing is they're trying to disperse these strikers who now have, um, who are now occupying basically, uh, uh Delhi and, uh, they're creating a war zone out of it. Cause that's how you really stop a peaceful strike is you turn it into a war zone. On February 11th, um, they had the first Kisan Mahapanchyat, or Mahapanchyat, I think is how you would actually pronounce it, uh, or the Great Local Farmer Gathering. And it drew in massive support, right, from various... Again, it's like they, there was a bunch of, like, solidarity strikes that happened, much like in January on January 26th, and much like on Thanksgiving. And corporate media doesn't want to talk about that. They're just like, oh, these are these lone, crazed farmers just trying to keep their livelihood going. What a bunch of loonies. What a bunch of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs those folks are. Am I right? <laughs> trying to keep everything they've worked for their entire lives to be alive. Oh, man. What a bunch of assholes. Not letting capitalism and freedom take root in their country. So... Uh, this great local farmers gathering grew massive support uh, and had wide widespread uh, basically spread around the country 
various different states had something very similar to what happened uh, in, in Delhi there. Right. So now this is a big now this is starting to become a movement. It's not just about the strike. It's starting to become uh, a movement that is against neoliberalism in India. Uh, it's it's basically the farmers are are are, are the uh, the leading candlelight. I don't know. This is not the best analogy, but you guys understand what I'm saying. They're the ones leading the movement right now. Uh, much like, you know, Black Lives Matter and Defund the Police led the movement for criminal justice reform, for police reform, and completely redoing the, the justice system and addressing various other issues with capitalism and neoliberalism. Once those two movements meet the labor movement, I mean, you know, that's going to be a huge, huge shift in terms of who really has the power in this country. On February 18th, this organization, uh, this this Lead Farmers Union, is organizing a railway blockade. Again, to prove the point by disrupting something that people use every day to shine a light on what's going on because journalists uh, are being censored in India. So their story is not getting out. People like Amit Shah and, and the Modi government is controlling the narrative. It's saying that these people are, are violent. Here's something else that they're doing. They're blaming the Sikh. They're, they're saying that the strike is organized by Sikh separatists. Ain't that a bunch of bullshit? This anti-government Sikh separatists are coming in to disrupt and destroy everything. Now, they're, they're using this uh, narrative as a way to demonize and say that the, that the strikes and the Sikhs are a domestic terror problem. That's what they're trying to do. And uh, if you know anything about the Sikhs, uh, I did a podcast with one of the larger uh, Sikh organizations in America, Saldef, um, and we talked about media accountability and all that sort of stuff. Um, and they educated me on like Sikh principles and stuff. Really, it's not even a religion. It's a way of life, is my understanding to it. It's a way of life, uh, and it's a, it's a way of life uh, built on community and built on taking care of each other. And built on um, peace, right? They're they're peacekeepers, and they won't. They have a sword, but they won't draw their weapon unless their lives are in danger. So, all in all, in reality, the the strikers are practicing Sikh philosophy, but the Sikh philosophy is not a philosophy of terror. It's a philosophy of community, brotherhood, and sisterhood, solidarity, and defending yourself. Because guess what? When you talk about people coming together, the people up at the top that talk about individualism and keeping shit close to the vest, they don't fucking like it. And they want to fucking kill you. So you have to defend yourself with it. I'm a pacifist through and through. I don't believe in, in violent altercation unless you know, you're provoked into it, unless there is no other option. And I've talked about this several times is, you know, the people that are for like, we got to punch Nazis kind of thing. My view is, well, let me talk to them. If they still want to kill me, by all means, give me that opportunity to try to, 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 to solve this problem with diplomacy first. And if it fails, hey, by all means. And that's basically what the Sikhs are doing. And that's basically what the strikers are doing. That's basically what the farmer leaders are doing. They're like, this is a peaceful protest. We're literally here with camping equipment and tractors. Really, you know what might actually stop the cops from lob lobbing fucking tear gas into this encampment and like attacking these fucking strikers is you, they should just bring cows. They should bring cows into their ranks. Because in India, it's a sacred animal. And if they, if, if the Modi government truly is this devout Hindu government, they will order those cops to stop firing on the, uh, on the strikers. And they can't claim that, oh, this is religious persecution because a lot of those farmers are also Hindu and also believe that cows are sacred and also depend on the fucking cows as, as a, you know, a source of life. That's what they should do. 
And it puts the fucking Modi government in a tough spot. Because I bet you, oh fuck, I, holy shit, I bet you the second those cows show up, fucking Amit Shah and all those neoliberal douchebags up at the top are going to be like, fucking hell. And you know there's there's going to be a cop because this is how they're trained. There's going to be one fucking cop that's got an itchy trigger finger and, and just bang, bang. Oh no, now it becomes a religious strife, right? And, the, and what are they going to do? How are they going to control the narrative? I kind of think it's a cool idea. I hope, uh, hopefully, if there's somebody that <laughs> that knows people in India that is connected to this farmer strike, I hope they play this portion of the video to them <laughs> and give them a good idea to like try this. But check this out, man. Everything they're doing here is no different than what happened in the early 1900s and the late 1800s in America, right? Uh, because what is you know they're 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 blaming Sikh separatists here. Oh my God, these violent Sikh separatists! They're anti-Indian government and they don't believe in what India stands for and this, that, and the third and da 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 da, da and all this other shit. What 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 was the way that they they did it to um to to strikers in in uh, in Seattle when there was a general strike. When the police went on strike in Boston in 1919, when 1934, there was a series of general strikes all throughout the country from Toledo to Minneapolis to San Francisco. They called them Bolsheviks. Communists that want to take your freedom away. How is this propaganda that we're seeing in 2021 in India any different than the propaganda that was being levied against socialists and strikers and the labor movement in America in the early 1900s. It's not. There's almost no fucking difference. This is the same shit all the time. This is why it's important to learn fucking history, people. It's not just some academic shit that you learn. And you go to a party and be like, you know, I, I listened to NBR the other day and you are not going to believe that in night. Did you guys know? Let me tell you the origin of the peanut. No one gives a shit. Learn real history and fucking stop it from repeating on a global scale. This is no fucking different. Censoring journalists, that also fucking happened in the early 1900s in America. West Virginia, when coal miners went on strike and started marching, when Mother Jones started getting involved in, 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 those, in those strikes, the Democratic governor of fucking West Virginia wanted to shut down the socialist newspaper because he said it was a threat to American freedoms. In Boston, you weren't allowed to talk about the police strike unless it was to disparage it. Now we have Twitter that'll basically say, hey, if you talk about the strike, we're going to delete your account or block it or not let it be shown in India. How is that any different? The answer is it's fucking not. And this is here's here's the real fear, okay? And this is the real fear that the Modi government has about this strike, is, um, because the reality is, the BJP thrives on the on the religious division, right? In America, it's this left right division. That these that both the Democrats and the Republicans thrive on. They need they talk about unity, but really, if you pay attention to all the shit that they do, it's all about it's all about keeping conservatives away from uh, the lefties and the and the liberals. Yeah. In India, it's about Muslims and Hindus. If you look at both of those religions, the basic tenets of them almost the same. Fucking. Every religion talks about it. Take care of your neighbor. Be cool to each other. Stop being an asshole. That's all religions. Give up all, like, don't focus so much on material possessions and shit. All, all religions preach that sort of shit. It's about your community. It's about your relationships. 
It's about taking care of each other, connecting with humanity, connecting with something deeper, connecting with nature. Or, you know, if 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 God's your thing, connecting with God, connecting with the universe, whatever it is. It's not go after prophets. So really this pro fucking Hindu party going after prophets, going after enriching themselves is going against Hinduism. They're not really a fucking Hindu party, are they? They're a pro-capitalist party because they worship money. And that's the only thing that these fucking capitalist douchebags are ever going to fucking worship. And they're going to put people like this and gonna throw them under the bus and try to uh, try to keep dividing you between religious lines now, between political lines, between identitarian lines. That's what they do. They manufacture that divide. Instead of embracing your differences and learning from them and learning how to cooperate with them, they fucking use it as a point of divide and people still keep falling for it. And that's fucking depressing. Anyway, uh, good news, though, the labor movement in India led by these farmers is bridging that divide. Farmers in India are bringing together Hindus and Muslims who see the strife that the farmers are going through, who see the strife uh, the being joined by taxi workers, railway workers, laborers, tradesmen, and they're joining the fucking strike too. And they're going, let's put our fucking religion aside because this is about people. This is about people that we give a shit about. This is about people that feed us. Maybe our religion is not that important and maybe we should join in solidarity. Let's put our differences aside for a moment. And, and that's what's happening. So now they're going to extremes. Here's what they're doing. Let me share my screen here and show you guys. Sorry, I got very heated up at that moment. Uh, didn't mean to yet. I, I hope the audio didn't like fucking get too loud for you guys. Because uh, I get I get heated when I fucking talk about this. I apologize to Lee when I did his, uh, his live stream. I did apologize to him because I was like, hey, I'm sorry if I freaked out on your thing this thing just fucking irks me on a deep fucking level okay uh we're gonna we're gonna take a look at this i'm gonna put my notebook aside because it's primarily what we're gonna look at before we get to the last story uh ba -ba 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 -ba. okay so this is a Modi government has combined these vicious denunciation of the protesters with mounting state repression. Some of the most notable and recent examples of this include on February 13th, a Delhi police special cell arrested Disha Ravi, a 22 year old student and climate activist who helped found Fridays for the Future and was charged and charged her with sedition, sedition. They charged this woman with sedition for being a climate activist. OK, the basis of this draconian charge with the allegation that she disseminated a Google toolkit doc related to farmer protests in Delhi throughout social media sites. In a statement tweeted on Sunday, the Delhi police accused Ravi of being an editor of the toolkit and a key conspirator in the documents formulation and dissemination. The police also claimed that Ravi, along with these, uh, along with two others, collaborated with pro Khalistani Poetic Justice Foundation to spread disaffection against the Indian state. No, no, no. I don't think she's spreading disaffection through the Indian state. The Indian state's fucking doing that for himself. That's what it's doing. That. It's already doing that by itself. They're already fucking doing it by being against the people that feed most of the country. You understand? You went after people that feed most of the country and you're ensuring you're ensuring the privatization of it. You're ensuring that a country that can't fucking that that runs mostly on cash has a high poverty rate and you got you as Narendra Modi got elected because you claimed you could get people out of fucking poverty are now ensuring that this economic principle will keep people in poverty. In fact, it will make it fucking worse. So don't say that this lady is saying, oh, I have a Google Doc that will teach you how to uh, how to create strikes and create movements is d fucking spreading disaffection against the Indian state. In your definition, the Indian state is the government. No, the Indian state is the people. The farmers represent that more than Narendra Modi or, or Amit Shah or any of those douchebags in either par uh, par part of the Indian Congress. All right. Uh, 
On February 4th, the cybercrime cell of the Delhi police registered an FIR against pro Khalistan creators of a toolkit on farmers' protests, accusing them of waging social, cultural, and economic war against the government of India. The case against unnamed persons included charge of sedition, criminal conspiracy, and promoting hatred. The toolkit to the government's ire was uh, shared by uh, climate activist Greta Thunberg, who has backed the farmers' agitation. Again, uh, the per the people that are creating this social, cultural, and economic war is the government of India against the people of India, the people who they're supposed to represent and take care of as a fucking government. So yeah, get a toolkit going. And by the way, all of this shit that's going on right now, this is authoritarian. And this is the type of shit that can happen here any day of the week. Because India, much like America, is a representative democracy. Or so it claims. So this charge of sedition, criminal conspiracy, this is part of the thing of like, okay, if if you're gonna if you're basically gonna say like the people that stormed the Capitol are gonna get charged under sedition and criminal conspiracy and so on and so forth, they're gonna use that as leverage to go against the left. Do I think what happened on January sixth at the Capitol was correct? Absolutely not. But what's important is how they are charged. They did commit an insurrection. You can charge them for that. But if you say, oh, they planned this, and anybody that plans certain things like this, if there's a toolkit involved, if there is a, uh, you know, a Facebook group, a text chain, we're going to charge them with criminal conspiracy and sedition. Watch that kind of language. I brought this up yesterday. In the impeachment trial, they basically said words like fight and force are words that incite violence. So things like fight for 15, right? Fight for the future. Force the vote. Can be legally used as uh, inciting violence according to the impeachment trial. So it's important to pay attention to the language that these assholes use because that's how they get you. You might be against right wing, um, you know, demonstrations like what happened on the Capitol and me, too. But watch the language that they use, because that language can be translated to left wing protests, to labor movement strikes, to Black Lives Matter protests. And they're already attacking strikers and, and all that stuff. And this becomes a template that other countries can do. So India is doing this by using it as, oh, it's a cyber crime threat. How far is America away from doing something like this? They can use what happened at the Capitol on January 6th as a jumping off point. In fact, they're trying to. This is Patriot Act shit. This third one talks about the, the reporters um, that were deplatformed. It brings up another one. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Is this the one that brings up the other one? Uh, yeah, Twitter subsequently responded by declaring that it had blocked access to 97% of the accounts the government had said were spreading provocative content and misinformation. Yeah, talking to fucking farmers on the ground and getting their reports is considered provocative content and misinformation. Uh, okay. Uh, beginning of, on Tuesday, February 9th and continuing through Sunday, February 14th, the enforcement uh, directorate uh, raided the residents of managers, editors, and journalists of NewsClick. This is the new part. Yeah. An independent media portal based in Delhi. As uh, many such raids targeting journalists and NGOs, the state authorities claimed their actions were linked to money laundering cases. But the raids were transparently an attempt to intimidate NewsClick, which has provided extensive and sympathetic covers to farmers' agitation. This is what, they're, what they do. This is what we should be paying attention to. Because America is not that far away from this sort of crap happening here. And liberals have excused it on one side, but what happens when it ha comes to the other side? How far away are we? With everything that's happened since January 6th, people getting uh, sen economically censored on, on YouTube, so on and so forth.
how far away are we from them saying, oh, this guy's talking about strikes. This guy's talking about the labor movement. This guy's talking about the JFK assassinations. Okay, well, we got to put a task force together and start investigating these people and uh, get a warrant to check their homes. How far away are we from that? This is dangerous. And what's happening in India can very well happen here. And the fact that American media pretty much, uh, for all intents and purposes, does not care to um, to talk about this shit is, is a major problem. So that's why we have to talk about it. And this is not, you know, pro-India. No, the, if you were pro-India, you would be on the side of the farmers. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, let's look at some comments. Uh, the strikes are scary to MSM. Holly, you are absolutely correct. Uh, if it bleeds, it leads. That's why they cover the violence. Is that what it... Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that was actually a phrase that they used. If it bleeds, it leads. Uh, that explains, you know, this shit. Uh, that hashtag assaulted me with its sharp edges. Sure did. Very scary, those hashtags are. Uh, corporate media doesn't want to give people ideas about protests. Yeah, that's partly why they're going after the toolkits and stuff, right? Um, I mean, that's very close to being like, we're banning books. We're banning, we're banning this line of thought. Again, going into thought police type shit. 1984 was a work of fiction, not a manual. Uh, sue the sue the farmer for the theft of seeds. Yeah, that's pretty much what they'll do. Redneck Economics, good to see you. Thank you for tuning in. DID, thank you for tuning in as well. Uh, the ca the cow thing is a, is not a bad idea. It's worth trying. I yes, I agree. I I really hope that they do. I would love it. It would be crazy if they, uh, if if that if that catches uh catches wind there. Um, there you have it. Learn history. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Red Economic says, I'd love to have you on a guest uh, over on Roar Media. I would love to be a guest over on Roar Media. Uh, feel free to uh, hit me up via Facebook or email or, or, or whatever, however you, you feel you, you want to, uh, you want to do that. Uh, I will, I will try to hit you up uh, later tonight or, or tomorrow. Thank you. That's very kind of you to, to say. Uh, and audio was fine as I was yelling about this. Yeah, <laughs> good, good to know. I'm I'm glad that this mic is good enough that it doesn't uh, blow out the the sound of it. Uh, over on Rockfin, uh, Sarah says it will be Raytheon Bayer Monsanto soon when the weapons manufacturer declares the merger. Oh, is that actually a thing that's happening? I did not hear about this. But uh, yeah, why not? We have corporate consolidation on the side of food. Why not mix food and war together, right? That that makes total sense. It shouldn't be food, not bombs. It should be food and bombs. Am I right? Fucking idiots. <laughs> and it, it'll probably go through because we have a fucking um, uh, a Raytheon board member in charge of the Department of Defense. So why not let that merger go through? It was the same thing you, you uh, when when uh, Jeff Bezos acquired Whole Foods and everybody's like, this seems like it creating a monopoly for Amazon. And it was, but it didn't matter because one of the people approving it was a, a, a former Goldman Sachs uh, board member who's now on the board of Amazon. So, hey, what could fucking go wrong? What could fucking go wrong? Uh, these are all old tactics for sure. Yeah, they're a hundred year old tactics, and it's and they're and they're still in effect today. Uh, and part of that is unfortunately because not enough people have learned their history, and not enough people have learned from their past, uh, which is akin to a religion: Democrats versus Republicans. Yeah, I think political parties in America are probably akin to religion. There, there is a fanaticism. Um, you know, I to to the point where I even had a friend of mine who chat who you know was chastising me about not supporting Joe Biden. Um, you know, was was like, I'm not a Democrat either, but what you're saying is straw man's or this, that, and the third. It's like you can't even bring up talking about the fact that Obama went from two to seven wars without them being like, I'm not a Democrat, but come on, man. Like, no, that's also not excusable just because they have a D by their name. Like uh, sir says, this is why there's so much incentive to orchestrate events that can be used to punish people with legitimate grievances. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, 
you know, what happened on January 6th was like some FBI orchestration or anything of that sort. But I do think that they're going to use that. A lot of what I think it happens in capitalist driven uh, politics is opportunism. You know, there's a lot of people that believe that um, the pandemic was manufactured and all that. No, I think the pandemic was an opportunity for them to profit, for them to basically use it as an excuse to pump more money into the Fed and into the in, into Wall Street. And this, this is going to be the same thing, right? Last year, we saw basically the largest civil rights movement since the 60s. And they couldn't find a legitimate way to squash it. Well, now... Um, because they let Trump run his mouth as, as much as they did. Uh, and they kind of saw that as an opportunity to say, here's some shit that's going down on, at the Capitol. There's also evidence that says that the FBI and the cops kind of knew that this was coming and they just didn't do anything about it, which does go and just, it, it, it does kind of check out because the FBI knew about a lot of right wing violence that they didn't do much about. I think there's like one or two cases where they did try to intercept it. So, but they basically use it as a point of opportunity to say, well, let's make, you know, Patriot Act version two that specifically targets um, anybody that is talking about strikes, talking about defunding the police, talking about anti militarism, talking about anti interventionism. Um, and we'll claim that they're anti-American and a threat to national security or what have you, uh, just like the these folks were. So, yeah, it's very, very dangerous and uh, and very scary. Uh, da, 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 da. Redneck Economics says, yeah, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? Exactly. Shouldn't waste your food. You shouldn't waste a crisis. <laughs> but that's opposite for capitalism. It's. Uh, waste your food. Also, uh, let's not waste that crisis, though. Waste your food before you don't waste that crisis. <laughs> Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook especially Facebook and YouTube. They often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, um, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H 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 -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.